Today we began talking about how World War I got its beginnings, and it's largely a European conflict as a result of the, you know, what was our acronym that we used? World War I was caused by an animal, all right? So we talked about the alliance system and nationalism and imperialism and militarism and an assassination and then the leaders, the leadership, you know, Kaiser Wilhelm, um, the leadership of Great Britain, oh, eventually Woodrow Wilson of the United States. So we talked about the Lusitania and how America is getting involved. What was it about the sinking of the Lusitania that upset, it, upset so many Americans? Yeah, it was, there was, it was not a military vessel in what, any way whatsoever, and uh, hun, like over 100 Americans were killed. Now, despite this provocation, despite this provocation, Woodrow Wilson chooses not to use a military response in favor of a, you know, instead of using a military response, he's just going to kind of protest to Germany. And then three months later, after the sinking of the Lusitania, a U-boat sank another British liner called the Arabic. And there's a depiction of it, the Arabic. Drowning two Americans. Again, the United States protested. And this time, Germany agreed not to sink any more passenger ships. So Woodrow Wilson thinks, Phew, dodged a bullet. We're not going to have to get involved. But Germany broke their promise and again torpedoed an unarmed French passenger vessel called the Sussex. which had 80 passengers on it, some of which were American. I'm not entirely sure of the number, but there were Americans on it. Once again, Woodrow Wilson and the United States warned that it would break diplomatic relations. We're not going to, we're not going to use our words anymore unless Germany changes its tactics. And what, is the, what are the tactics that the Germans are using? What are they doing? What is their strategy? That's right. Any foreign ship that's not German, we're sinking. Because it's that, blo that blockade, the blockade. What their title of their strategy is, is called Unrestricted Submarine Warfare. That's the title of their strategy. Unrestricted Submarine Warfare. Because they're using U-boats, the Unterseeboots. So, after the sinking of the Sussex, Germ America was like Germany. We're gonna, we're, we're about to, we're about at the end of our, our rope here. So Germany agreed that they would change their tactics under a condition that they would stop using unrestricted submarine for warfare if the United States would persuade Britain to lift its blockade. Okay, the Germans want the blockade lifted. Why? Because their people are starving to death, and if they if the United States would be able to do that, then Germany would consider stopping the unrestricted submarine warfare. But if they are unsuccessful, the unrestricted submarine warfare would continue. So an ultimatum is given: you do this in order for this to happen. All the while this is going on, it's an election year. 1916. The Democratic Party renominated Woodrow Wilson. Dante Mayer, you need to report to Miss Barr's room. Dante Mayer, report to Miss Barr's room. So, yeah, all the while this is going on, it's an election year, and the Democratic Party <coughs> renominated Woodrow Wilson. And the Republican Party nominated the Supreme Court Justice of the United States, actually. His name is Charles Evans Hughes. Wilson's campaign slogan was, he kept us out of war. So, 
It was a very close election. The returns shifted from hour to hour. In fact, Charles Evans Hughes went to bed thinking that he had been elected president of the United States. When a reporter went to his home and tried to reach him to tell him that actually Woodrow Wilson had won, uh, one of uh, Charles Evans Hughes' aides said, we're sorry, the president can't be disturbed because he's sleeping. And the reporter said, well, when, he's wake, when the president wakes up, tell him he's not the president. It's funny. I thought it was funny. Anyway, but that, that's real. So uh, ultimately, though, after the election, Woodrow Wilson tries to mediate between the sides that are warring together, the, the alliances. And that ultimately fails, you know, that attempt fails. So the Germans continue to ignore Woodrow Wilson's calls for peace. Germany's leaders hope that to defeat Britain by even not 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 just resuming unrestricted German unrestricted submarine warfare, but by ramping it up even more. And the Kaiser, the leader of Germany, announced that U-boats would sink all ships in British waters, whether they be hostile or neutral, whatever. Doesn't matter what they are. Anything, anything near Great Britain, we're shooting it. Unrestricted, completely unrestricted. If you're out there fishing in a rowboat, you're going down. Okay? That's, that's, that was, became the, the, the Germans' position. So the, Woodrow Wilson is absolutely stunned by this. Stunned. And the dessert, that German decision meant the United States would have to go to war. Another thing that led to the United States joining the war was this intercepted telegram called the Zimmerman Note the Zimmerman Note, which is depicted in this newspaper article on the right. The Zimmerman Note. Okay. This is a telegram from the German foreign minister, so a German government leader, sent to the German ambassador to Mexico. You know how every country has like ambassadors that send to other countries? <coughs> the United States isn't the only country that has ambassadors. So the German ambassador in Mexico was sent this note. However, it was intercepted by British secret agents. James Bond, I guess. The content of the Zimmerman telegram is pretty, pretty inflammatory. The, the, what this telegram proposes is an alliance between Mexico and Germany and what it promises is that Germany would support Mexico in recovering the lost territory of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona if they could get the United States to break into the war in hopes that Germany would win and then Mexico could get their land back. Also, in doing so, Mexico would declare war on the United States and the United States would be fighting wars on two fronts one in our own backyard, and one in Europe. Pretty inflammatory, huh? That'd be like, you know, you seeing a text message from, from somebody you don't really get along with to your, to your next door neighbor telling them to, you know, go key your car or something. You know? Would that make you mad? You're not really mad at your neighbor because they're just receiving the message. Who are you mad at? The person sending it. So that, that really upset a, a lot of people in the United States, and it alarmed even more people. Like, imagine living, if you live in Texas, you might not be an American anymore. 
So that's pretty upsetting. So that was a, that was a pretty big incentive for America to join the war. Another the incentive, well, not really an incentive, but a push factor that pushed America into war was that the Russian czar, the leader of Russia, he was overthrown. His name is Tsar Nicholas. That's his picture up there on the left. That's not our Luke Ferdinand. That's Tsar Nicholas. He's overthrown. His entire family's murdered in Russia. And instead of having a czar, which is kind of like a king or a Caesar, an emperor, they were... They attempt to replace that type of government with a representative government. So now, supporters of the war could be like, hey, we're allying, uh, allying ourselves with a democracy, a representative government, not an emperor, not a tyrant. So that makes it a little bit easier for Americans to, to tolerate it because we're not making friends with you know, dictators. We're making friends with a democracy. Obviously, democracy doesn't last long, as after you know, that the democracy fails, Russia has their own civil war, and it re is replaced with communism, Bolshevik, Bolshevik revolution. But at the time, America, it makes it easier for America to join. So in April, on April, uh, in April of 1917, America passed a resolution to, de to join World War I. To and the reason for, the, for the America to join was to make the world safe for democracy. To make the world safe for democracy. All right. You guys have seen this depiction of Uncle Sam? This one was created during World War I. This I want you... That, that look of Uncle Sam, that, 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 that is created for the sole purpose of World War I. And its purpose is to do what? What's the purpose of this Uncle Sam poster right here? You've all seen it. To get men to enlist. Because what, whether we're going to war or not, we're not prepared at all. The United States was not prepared at all. We just fought a war like... 20 years prior, where did we fight that war? Yeah. Cuba. Were we ready for that? What did we train our, our troops with? Broomsticks. We're ready. Yeah, let's go fight. How did they train them with broomsticks? You know, you march around. Instead of marching around with a gun, you use oh. a stick. You practice aiming with a stick. That'll get you ready. Those stakes are loud. So, at the time we began, only 200,000 men were in the service when war was declared. So drastic measures were needed to be taken to make a large enough impact in, in Europe to, to make a difference. So, to meet the, the government's need for more fighting power, Congress passes the Selective Service Act in May of 1917. Do you gentlemen know what the Selective Service Act is? It's still on the books today. What about you ladies? Do you know? This, go ahead. Wouldn't it like draft any boy who was like 17 years or older to go to the war? The, the Selective Service Act requires that all men register with the government so that if they are needed, they could be randomly selected for military service. I'm registered with the Selective Service. Anyone that turn any boy in the United States upon your 18th birthday, you must register for the Selective Services. Ladies, you're not required to do that. Boys, you have to. You want to live and enjoy the freedoms of America? That's one of the things you got to do. It is a it is your duty, gentlemen. You just never know. You just never know. 
Currently, there is no draft. Every single person in the United States military of all branches chose to be there. They're all volunteers. Now, they're getting paid. They're not like free volunteers. But nobody was like, hey, you are going to fight in the United States Marine Corps. You are drafted. There's no, no one in the service has been drafted. Okay? Now, what if something were to happen and, I don't know, say we started losing tens and thousands of soldiers? Do you think we might need to replace them? I don't know about you, but I'm not, you know, I'm not willing to sign up. But if they made me go, I wouldn't have any choice. And that's what the Selective Service Act does. Okay? It's just an official draft. It was used in World War I. It was used in World War II. It was used in the Vietnam conflict. Okay? So, it sounds not fair, but do you rather have something a little not fair, or would you rather have, mm, I don't know, no America? Because that's kind of the point. That's kind of the point. So, uh, by the end of 1918, 24 million men had registered. 24 million men had registered. Of that, men, of that number, 3 million were called into military service. 3 million. Of that 3 million, 2 million actually made it to Europe. And of that 2 million, 1.5 million saw conflict. So a million and a half Americans made it into battle in Europe. Most of them were poor. Most of them never went to high school. One in five of them were not even born in America. They were immigrants. About 400,000 of the three million were African American. So a significant portion served in the armed forces. And they served in segregated units. There was no mixing of the races. Isolated from one another. So the 18-month training period, once you get drafted, partly took place in the United States and then partly took place in Europe. But during that eight months of training, you spend about 17 hours a day Part doing target practice, bayonet drills, kitchen duty, cleaning up the grounds, marching. And once again, since real weapons were in short supply, soldiers often drilled with fake weapons, rocks instead of grenades, wooden poles or broomsticks instead of rifles. Once again, and they're getting ready to go into trench warfare where you, know, you stick your head out of a trench and 50 people with machine guns are shooting at you. Women were not allowed to enlist. However, um, they, were, they were reluctantly accepted into the Army Corps of Nurses. Uh, they were not given any rank. They did not receive equal pay or benefits. But 13,000 women accepted non-combat positions in the Navy and Marines where they served as nurses and secretaries, telephone operators. So women definitely had a, had a role to play in World War I. But is it really our troops that are the big difference in World War I as far as the Allies winning the war? What's the major difference about America joining the war effort? The big difference maker. Yeah, I mean, some troops are helped. You know, three million extra troops, that helps. But in a war where you lose a million, a million six, 1.6 million people in one battle, is three million troops really a lot? So what's, what's the big thing about America that really puts, America, puts the allies over the top? Yeah, our economy, our ability to produce, our resources. You know, the Army was definitely great. But it had to be created and trained, transported, had to be sent, had sent along with food and equipment over thousands of miles of ocean. It was an immense task and it took a long time. 
All this was made more difficult by the unrestricted German submarine warfare. Anything you send over might not even make it. So, um, we have to get this stuff over there, and it's a problem. It's a big problem. So, in order to begin production, the United States government begins to take some action, okay? First off, if you work at a shipyard where you're building ships or loading ships or if you will, like something of that nature, and you get drafted, you are not drafted. You, you keep working on the ships. You are, if you're a shipbuilder, you don't get drafted. We need you to build the ships to get the stuff over. So that is called a deferred classification. That's one of the first steps the government took for shipyard workers. Is they exempted them from the draft. Um, if they, automobiles were kind of a new thing, and they asked citizens that actually owned automobiles to give people rides to work, especially if they worked at the shipyards. Can you imagine, like, hey, you got the government coming to your house and be like, hey, we see you have a car. You care to get somebody a ride? They did that. They did that during World War I. Another thing the government did is that shipyards began to use prefabrication techniques. Instead of building an entire ship one piece at a time in the yard, standardized parts were sent to different locations and built elsewhere, and then all the, the completed assembly parts were then met, put together in the shipyard. So instead of having everything in the same place to build the ship all at once, it's like, okay, we're going to build the engine over here, the transmission over here, we're going to build the the place where the captain, you know, the cabin there, we're going to build all the, the guns over here, and then we'll all show up on the same day and put them on the boat together. And it makes the production much, much faster. They do this with homes. If you've ever heard of like a manufactured home or a prefabricated home, they build the home in a factory and then they just deliver it and put it together one piece at a time. Not one piece at a time, but one section at a time. That's what prefabricate, pre, prefabrication techniques are. Another thing the government did is they took private sh and commercial vessels, ships, and, and then like converted them into warships. So if like you had, you know, you were you were a merchant, you shipped stuff overseas, the government had the ability to commandeer your vessels, mount machine guns and cannons on them, and say, okay, we're going to put a men on this, and it's going to be their vessel. Okay. I will stop there since we're out of time.